I have often spoken of how the whole process of human life comes to expression in the human form. By properly understanding the human head, we can discern how its specific configuration and shape is the outcome of former lives, which each person underwent before he descended again to his present existence on earth. And if we likewise consider the nature of our limb system, naturally also including here this system's further spatial connection with the position of various inner organs, then we find something which, after undergoing certain metamorphoses, certain transformations, will eventually become the foundation for the head's development in a future that lies beyond death. At the same time, however, this points us to the human being's connection with the cosmos. We can say that the head configuration of a person who stands before us is a metamorphosis of his former limb configuration, but also that we possess the head in this form due to what we underwent in cosmic realms before we embarked on life on earth. The form of our head is largely due to Saturn, Sun, and Moon stages of evolution, while our limb system is in turn a point of departure for Jupiter, Venus, and Vulcan evolutionary stages. The only intrinsically earthly part of us is embodied in the nature of our present rhythmic system. We can therefore say the following. The human head we see directly before us has evolved from three embodiments of our planet which preceded the earth stage. And what is at work in our present limbs is the point of departure for subsequent planetary embodiments of the earth. As we pass through the life between death and a new birth, in a sense we repeat spiritually what we underwent during Saturn, Sun and Moon stages. We return our earthly organism to states it possessed during Saturn, Sun and Moon. And in the same way the limb system developed on earth will become further integrated and reorganized into physical reality during Jupiter, Venus, and Vulcan embodiments of the earth. These things thus have both a human earthly aspect and a cosmic aspect. We can therefore also see human head formations, excuse me, human head formation in terms of the human being's relationship with the cosmos. Yet what occurred during Saturn and Sun evolution lies at a somewhat further remove from our human mode of reflection, and so these conditions are less accessible to earthly judgment. By contrast, we are certainly, we can certainly evaluate what occurred during old moon evolution, since this is repeated, in a sense, in the realities unfolding in the interplay between our present earth and moon. This allows us to study how the interaction between earth and moon relates to the human head. And by considering these realities, we discover certain secrets of human form and development, as I will now try to explain. In a schematic picture of the human being standing on the earth, we see that he is not located at its very center, but is distant from this center by the length of the earth's radius. Taking this to represent the human head, as a drawing, we can see that the moon not only orbits the earth but also the human head. This is of course just a schematic way of presenting it, not in proportion, which would certainly pose some problems. Now let's assume that the moon is here and is full and thus radiates to us what is always regarded as its reflected light. The sunlight is therefore working upon us. When I say us, I am now referring to our head. New moon would be on the opposite side here, and no light reaches us then, so that at this phase we are, in a sense, left to our own devices. Fewer demands are made on us by the outer stimulus of light, and at this period we are therefore freer to attend to our inner development. 
Now if we draw the first quarter of the moon here and here the last, waxing and waning moon, in both cases we experience less stimulus from the light shining upon us at either of these phases than we do at full moon, yet a greater degree of stimulus than at new moon. Besides this, of course, the moon also passes through the zodiac as it describes this path around the earth. And this determines and, if you like, differentiates the particular quality of light in each case. You see, moonlight is different in quality depending on whether it emanates from a place in the heavens behind which Aries stands or from a part of the sky where Virgo is located. Moonlight acquires a distinctive quality by virtue of the particular zodiac figure it is passing in front of. And there's a plate to see. Now let us picture what I have sketched here acting at a particular moment of human development when the spiritual nucleus of the human being, having passed through the development it undergoes between death and a new birth, is, through certain processes, attaching itself firmly as embryo within the mother's womb. During this period the moon works upon the embryo. Here, through the action of the moon initially, though naturally in interplay with other planetary bodies, the human head is configured in the mother's womb by the influence of the cosmos. The human head is certainly configured by the moon. You will say, and rightly, that we cannot assume either that the light of the full moon will shine directly upon the eyes or nose of the embryo, nor that of the occiput, whose inner development must be left to itself and not to external influences, will face precisely toward new moon. There is no need for that, certainly, but in general we can say the full moon will be active upon the countenance at some point, and likewise that the new moon will be at work somewhere or other upon the occiput. The child in the womb has a particular position and orientation toward the cosmos. As the moon shines more and or less obliquely upon the part of the embryo that is to become the countenance, so the child will be endowed with particular inner capacities insofar as these depend upon the head. He will, in fact, be differently endowed, physically endowed, when the bright moonlight shines toward his mouth, for instance, than when it shines toward his eyes. This relates to human endowments insofar as these depend on the cosmos. But the thing of prime importance for us here is that formation of the human embryo, whose development proceeds from the head, is subject to influences that emanate largely from the moon, since the head is the first part of the human being, to form. And this development proceeds from the moon, and thus from the vestiges on our earth remaining over from the movement and influence of old moon, and in general from preceding embodiments of our earth's evolution. Here you see the cosmic connection between the human head and the outer world, how, during embryonic development, we are integrated into cosmic realms that are largely informed by the moon and its activity. But this happens by the moon itself making the movement, that is, really orbiting the head. During our embryogenesis, the moon circles round us ten times. Thus the moon first passes in front of us and forms the human countenance then leaves in peace excuse me then leaves this in peace to develop and fill out while it circles behind us after facial development has rested in this way the moon reappears and refreshes it it does this 10 times and during these 10 moon months the human head is rhythmically formed by the cosmos in this way we have 10 periods of 28 days during which we dwell in the womb under the influence of cosmic powers mediated by the moon. What is really happening here? 
Well, as being of spirit and soul, we first approach from the cosmos the individual whom we have chosen to be our mother. And now the moon takes on the role of forming our head. If we remained in the womb for twelve months, twelve moon months, an entirely self-enclosed sphere would develop. But we do not. We stay there only ten months. And therefore something remains open in our development, which after birth is the focus of activity of everything that works in from the cosmos. Prior to birth, ten twelfths of the cosmic powers work upon the development of our head, while the remaining two twelfths are left over for our development outside the womb. But this post-birth development already begins during the embryonic period. Apart from the cosmic powers, other forces also work upon us, emanating largely from the earth itself. These do not influence our head, but our limbs. If you imagine the earth here, and this as a schematic depiction of the limbs, then the forces which play into these limbs, or continue on into them, are largely earthly telluric ones. See plate to it. Earth forces play into arms and hands, and in legs and feet. They play in there, reverberating inward to become metabolism. What becomes metabolism within us, you see, is an interaction of forces in the outer world. When you move your arms or legs, this movement is not so straightforward, but is connected with the earth's forces. Whenever you move your legs, when walking, you have to overcome the earth's gravity, and what arises there results from the interplay between forces within us and the forces of gravity. Whereas what works within us in metabolism interacts with the chemical properties of earthly substance, the activity in our arms and legs enters into interaction with the forces of the earth. What develops here is connected with temporal relationships that are different from those inside the womb. In the womb, we find ten times twenty-eight days at work, thus ten moons and a certain number of days, a daily cycle that occurs two hundred and eighty times. Here we are largely concerned with the cycle of the day. In the case of limb development, on the other hand, we are concerned with what we can regard as the year's cycle. This is also why we find that in the first period of development the human limbs form very rapidly, but then come ever more slowly to completion. In fact, we really need 28 years to fully develop our limbs outside of the womb, although the last seven of these no longer show this development so visibly as up to the age of 21. It does, however, already commence in the womb. Just as our head is connected with the past and its development can now occur because the moon's relationship to the earth repeats this past evolution of Saturn's sun and moon, so our limbs as such are connected with the earth yet at the same time also with the way Jupiter, Venus and Vulcan conditions are being prepared during this earth stage. This is why we cannot really develop our head directly upon the earth. The earth is powerless in relation to the development of the human head. The head can only arise as a metamorphosis of the previous incarnation's limbs by virtue of the powers we bring with us from before birth, before conception, which are then protected in the womb from the external earth environment while the moon continues to work upon the head. And the limbs, subject to the influence of the earth, cannot come to full completion through earthly development. They cannot reach the head's perfection. During our earthly evolution, we cannot yet accomplish what we will be able to during Venus evolution. Then, we will jettison our head in the same way as the deer casts its antlers and will develop a different head out of the rest of our organism. This Venusian condition, in fact, will be an enviable one. Yet it is also true to say that we can gain spiritual vision already of this future state. 
From our narrow and constricted earthly view of things, reality can appear grotesque, yet such realities surpass what we can initially grasp with our limited earthly reason. We have to give serious credence to the fact that our merely earthly modes of observation contain only a small portion of reality, and that in fact we really know next to nothing about the human being if we consider only earthly conditions. We therefore have a cosmic being within us, initially outwardly developed largely in the womb, and then an earthly being that develops under the influence of earthly conditions, is configured and differentiated as the sun, seemingly, circles the earth, and at the same time passes before the constellations of the zodiac. Thus, we have two opposing states within us, a cosmic condition, a cosmic being, and a being of earth. The cosmic entelechy really acts in such a way as would endow us from the cosmos with a completely round head. The face is formed only by virtue of sunlight gazing upon the head through the moon, and then the foundation of the occiput forms when this sunlight averts its gaze. The spherical nature of the cosmic influence becomes differentiated. If the good moon did not exist to configure the head, we would be born as a wholly undifferentiated sphere. And then, on the other hand, because the mother of the child in the womb is on the earth, the earth's influence acts too. We do not merely develop a head in the embryo, because the earth is already exerting its influence as the head is being formed. If we were exposed only to the earth's influence and to no cosmic one, we would develop as a pillar, You can say that we are enclosed or embedded between the earth's radial, pillar-like action and the spherical action of the cosmos. Our development is indeed founded on both circle and radius. The fact that we are not born as a pillar with conjoined feet and hands is because an annual cycle exists, because winter and summer exert their spiritual influence and point us to diverse cosmic connections between the earth and its surroundings. The differentiation arising between winter and summer is similar to that between full moon and new moon. Just as the fluctuation between full and new moon determines the difference between countenance and occiput, so the cosmic powers that come to expression in winter, summer, spring, and autumn govern the configuration of our limbs. And thus we have two legs rather than being a single pillar. We are not entirely cosmic in our head, in other words, but rather what we might describe as, quote, cosmic modified by earth, close quote. The earth's seasonal cycle is, after all, governed by the cosmos, And so we have a cosmic entity influenced by the earth and an earthly entity influenced by the cosmos. If our cosmic aspect were subject to no earthly influence, we would become a sphere. And if our limbs were not also subject to a cosmic influence, we would become a pillar. This interplay of cosmic and earthly comes to expression, therefore, in our earthly form. We cannot understand this human form without seeing in it the interplay between the earth and the cosmos. It is wonderful that we, are in ex- that we are an expression of the whole universe, of the world of stars that expresses itself in our whole form, and that we are at the same time a reflection or image of the forces that stream from the earth and also govern us. Try to imagine for a moment what our earthly being would be like without any cosmic influence. We do not bear this earthly being in us as such, but it acts in us, is, as it were, what underlies us, and rays out of the earth's center. What appears in our human strength, acting also in this strength as will, was in ancient times called by a word that we could translate as vigor or strength. See plate 2. What forms us out of the cosmos, on the other hand, which we must picture as a sphere, 
and which principally is responsible for developing our head, but does not come to full expression, since it is modified or moderated by the earth, used always to be called beauty in ancient times. And so if we take a broader view, we find at work in us things whose value surpasses and encompasses both the physical and moral realms. The strength emanating from the earth that acts as energy in us is, you see, simultaneously the power of morality and the physical strength of our muscles. And the beauty shining around us upon which our head is founded appears in our head as the beauty of thoughts, both in a physical and in a moral and ethical sense. Between what we are as earthly being, modified by the cosmos, and what we are as cosmic being, modified by the earth, our trunk is situated. And what is this? Basically, it is our rhythmic nature which continually allows the cosmic to swing down toward the earthly and the earthly to swing up toward the cosmic. Within us we have a continual circulation that leads what lies in our limbs into the head via breathing and likewise via breathing leads what is in our head into the limbs. A continual back and forth swell or tide between head and limbs. Our rhythmic system, the system of lungs and heart at work in blood circulation, mediates this tide. How can we regard blood circulation, therefore, as something harnessed between the radial and the spherical and configured by the zodiac and the planets? At work here is something that emanating from the head lives in a power which continually seeks to govern our blood in a circular way and from the limbs acts continually as a force that seeks to govern the blood radially. In the interplay of these forces, the whole blood circulation's tendency to circularity and the forces continually tending toward linearity, our blood circulation arises in us stimulated by breathing. This rhythmic system mediates both cosmic and earthly within us, thus weaving together the beauty of the cosmos and the strength of the earth. Seen soul spiritually, this interwoven union in our trunk or thorax has since ancient times been named wisdom. The beauty of the cosmos projected inward into the human being is the wisdom that lives in his thoughts. At the same time, also, the moral strength that derives from the vigor of the earth passes through our sensibility to become moral wisdom. Within us, earthly and cosmic wisdom meet in the rhythmic system. The human being is an expression of the whole cosmos, and if we wish to, we can understand how we are configured. We can, in a sense, gaze into the secrets of the universe insofar as we are shaped by them. We can even see this, and we have previously looked at this from another perspective in a reality of earthly life itself. We can regard the cosmic beauty working into us via the head as the woman's contribution and the earthly vigor that arises in us as that of the man, and then we can say that the cosmic and terrestrial unite in the act of impregnation. We cannot re actually grasp our human task on earth if we do not differentiate what is at work in this distinctive configuration. You see, what forms as the head does so by virtue of the fact that earthly forces cannot initially act upon us as we bring our pre-birth nature into the earthly realm. And because extra telluric powers work to shape us in the womb through the moon's mediation. From the earth, vigor or strength act to form our limbs. This vigor cannot perfect the limb system before death. The forces in our limbs have to spiritualize themselves, acquire soul nature. And then between death and a new birth, they are transformed as soul and spirit qualities initially into head development. On earth something acted upon them that is not capable of perfecting them 
because the head will only emerge from our human limbs once we reach the stage of Jupiter and Venus development. Thus what acts upon earth does not affect us between birth and death. What previously acted on Saturn, Sun and Moon has now become spiritual and must be developed spiritually before a new birth. And what passes through death must in turn be spiritualized. Then the past can embrace the future so that the human limb organization can in turn become head. You can say therefore that we die in order to acquire the capacity in the world of spirit to bring to expression a form partly modified by earth which can be expressed by virtue of the fact that we passed through stages of Saturn, Sun and Moon evolution. Here on earth our limb system as earthly nature can only be experienced inasmuch as it is elaborated by our rhythmic system. But we are preparing the future in our limbs. They cannot come to completion. We have to die and return to the head which is initially prefigured in pre-earthly existence. Therefore our human form is connected with our repeated lives on earth. We are born physically as a being formed from Saturn, Sun and Moon conditions and from the world of spirit we acquire the potential to express in spherical form what we underwent in these three stages of evolution. It is due to this, therefore, that we acquire a head on earth, which continually kills us, however, since it is not earthly by nature. These things that come to expression in our repeated human lives on earth have an intimate connection with cosmic evolution. It is not true to say that human beings cannot gain insight into such things as we have touched on today and will elaborate tomorrow and the day after. We can certainly gain insight into them. They must be investigated through spiritual science. But everyone who activates a healthy grasp of ideas and interconnections can understand them. It is a common refrain that people cannot directly evaluate what spiritual science states. But to say that the spiritual researcher presents me with things I cannot evaluate myself is like saying I can't do differential calculus after I've taken my maths A-levels. Everyone can learn what spiritual science presents, just as all can learn, in principle, to solve differential equations. In fact, the latter is harder than the former. It is untrue to say one cannot gain insight into these things because of a lack of clairvoyant capacities. That's an excuse. Just as we don't need to be clairvoyant to solve differential equations, so we don't need to be clairvoyant to grasp these connections between the cosmos and the external world. All we need do is apply some healthy thinking to the problem. Yet people frequently say exactly the opposite that they cannot tell what is correct when one person has one view of the world and another a different one. If we are consistent, tracing things carefully and considering everything that has been said, all is unambiguously clear. Beauty, wisdom and strength are indisputably clear. It is clear that our head develops spherically while the rest of our organism reveals the radially organized element of strength. These things cannot be hedged about with caveats, but bring us to specific findings. Yet here lies a difficulty in disseminating spiritual science today. There are associations where lectures are given on anthroposophy or the threefold social order, which is of course a social outcome of spiritual science. People listen, then move on to the next lecture on a different subject, and then to something different again but they hold back from developing any real power of resolve. They simply take spiritual science as something in a series of other things, but this won't do for the science of the spirit. The other world views that emerge today can go along with this. One is perhaps a bit better, the other a bit worse. People listen to all these different approaches and take a nibble here and a nibble there, but this won't do for spiritual science 
It goes to the heart of things, and resolve is required. And you really have to exert your willpower in a way that leads to the kind of inner decisiveness that does not sit on the fence and contemplate a whole series of things, but which seeks to go to the very foundations. You can't go to the very foundations of things if you just oscillate between one worldview and another, taking a nibble where you feel like it. The science of the spirit requires energetic engagement. And this is why it runs counter to the zeitgeist and has to make headway against all the laziness and weakness of these times. It demands a strength and acuity of mind that is unwelcome today since it disrupts people's comfortable outlook. In ancient times, certainly, people had instinctive views of these things, and the ancient texts, which our scholars study but fail to understand, reveal a wisdom in which these connections between the human being and the cosmos were implicit. Then this wisdom was lost and human beings were cast back into chaos. People must rescue themselves from this chaos by their own powers of will, consciously rediscovering their connection with the cosmos. We can rediscover it. Today I began by saying that people completely fail to understand the head if they do not regard it as an outcome of the cosmos, and nor do they understand the limbs if they cannot regard them as an outcome of earthly development. Between these two lies the chest, the rhythmic organism, which continually seeks to make what is spherical straight and straight what is spherical. If you consider the blood vessels, you find a linear tendency, one also that seeks to reshape the sphere into the straight line. The way the blood vessels develop is connected with the movements of the stars and so forth. Their shape is connected with the constellations and the blood movement with planetary movements, as I have mentioned in the past in other contexts. But what happens in our human sensibility by absorbing such insights? For someone who absorbs them, they become as self-evident as mathematical truths. Certainly mathematical truths are transparent and self-evident, though not for every fifteen-year-old, yet these things are as clear as crystal. At the same time, they have a decisive effect on our feelings. This wisdom gives rise to a sense of the divine. Only superficial knowledge of things can remain irreligious, whereas one that plumbs the depths cannot be. If we look once more upon our connection with the cosmos, above all, finding in the beauty of the starry heavens enfolding us a reflection of spiritual immanence, then we can in turn infuse art with this. If we do, there lives in art not just external nature as we receive it with our senses, but as I said in our opening lecture, a union of science, art and religion which we seek here at the Gertianum and which can be achieved through a science of the spirit that goes to the very core of things. Let us recall something said by the individual whose name the Gertianum celebrates, quote, Possessing science and art, we also have religion. Possessing neither, we need religion. Close quote. Close quote. In other words, we need its outer form. But we possess it inwardly if we nurture the foundations of science and art, and that is Goethe's ethos. Possessing science and art, we also have religion. And this is why those who strive to find a unity of religion, art, and science are truly entitled to call the institution where they work the Gertianum. But here, too, insight into what I have described is no task for our era's superficial delectation, which looks askance at everything and takes but a nibble of this or that. Spiritual science requires resolve. Resolve is necessary because this spirit seeks to penetrate the world's depths, and therefore this also has to be grasped from the depths of the human heart. <laughs>